on behalf of everyone at the court, um, you know that we have been through a year of um, of remoteness, um, and I would say that, that with your cooperation and the court's outstanding um, staff, we have um, been able to conduct justice effectively and efficiently remotely. Um, and we're now in the phase where we're beginning to um, open up some proceedings to the court. Obviously, we're beginning, as you know, with criminal jury trials. Um, it may be that if there are not criminal jury trials, then we'll go forward with civil jury trials uh, in their place. Um, and uh, the courthouse has just worked incredibly hard to, to get it right. Uh, I'll let um, Nora and folks tell you about it, but I do want to just three special shout outs to Judge Smith, who very early on when the pandemic hit and I was overwhelmed as chief judge, he agreed to take over the issue of understanding the science and the medicine and dealing with a, um, a safe reopening in every way. And I couldn't, I could not, it, the court could not have done it without him um, agreeing to that. So I want to thank him for that. And um, he worked ably with Frank Perry and others, uh, particularly a special shout out to Frank who's done a phenomenal work at making sure that, um, did you hear all the nice things I said about you, Judge Smith? Yeah, yeah. You, you got cut <laughs> off, so I think you should go on a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, all I have to say is I'm going to turn it over to Nora, who's going to tell you what the kind of agenda is for um, today and let the good people that actually run the show um, take it from here. So, Nora? Thanks, Judge. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, we're going to watch a quick video. It's about eight minutes long that we did just to show you what the inside of the courthouse looks like now and hopefully will help you um, get kind of reoriented and help you talk to your clients. Um, then we've got with us a special guest, Dr. Aaron Bromage, who has been consulting for our court and many others and many other places during this pandemic and has really helped to inform our, um, our practices. So he's going to talk um, for about 10 minutes, um, answer questions that you have, give uh, insight into our um, testing program um, and kind of how we got to where we are today. And then we have a couple of our civil practitioners who have joined us today. Uh, they were the last who uh, uh, were in the courthouse to do a civil jury trial. So they're going to share a couple of bits of advice and kind of their impressions of what that was like and um, hopefully will help inform you all as well. And then we'll leave it open for questions and comments at the end. Um, so without further ado, uh, I will share my screen and we'll watch that video. Hello, my name is Frank Perry and I am the Chief Deputy Clerk for the U.S. District Court for the District of Rhode Island. This past year has been full of challenges, opportunities, and achievements. The recent unprecedented times presented by the COVID-19 pandemic has required many unique responses by us all. Since the closing of the courthouse doors to the public last March, the majority of the court's business has been conducted remotely. However, due to the efforts of the task force on reopening the court and the services of Dr. Erin Bromage, a nationally known public health expert, we have safely resumed weekly grand jury proceedings, conducted three in-person civil trials, and have several in-person hearings scheduled in the coming months. As we begin to discuss the resumption of in-person criminal trials, we have made this short video to let you know the steps we are taking in the District of Rhode Island to not only ensure your safety, but to ensure a defendant's Sixth Amendment right to trial. Please know that the health and safety of all visitors to the U.S. Courthouse are of extreme importance to us. To that end, we have instituted the following precautions to protect your health and safety for when you return. Before anyone steps inside the courthouse, they are required to answer a series of COVID-19 screening questions. Additionally, the screening questions will be included in the packet of materials that jurors receive in advance of impanelment. The day before your scheduled proceeding, all case participants must visit the court's website to download and complete the series of COVID-19 questions. Upon successful completion of the questionnaire, you will receive a QR code via text message. Please do not delete this message. You will use this code at our temperature kiosk on the day of your arrival. Please note that the front courthouse doors remain closed. All visitors must report to the rear of the courthouse on the Washington Street side. This is the street between the courthouse and the Pastore building. The vehicle gate will be open prior to your arrival and a court security officer will be present to guide you to the rear entrance of the building. 
Upon arrival, you will be greeted by a clerk's office staff member who will assist you with our temperature kiosk. If your temperature is within acceptable limits, you will then proceed through security. We've initiated enhanced cleaning throughout the courthouse and there will be hand sanitizer stations, disinfecting wipes and service, disinfecting sprays available. Please note a three layer mask or higher is required. If you do not have one, one will be provided to you upon arrival. I'm Nora Tyrewittick, the Clerk of the United States District Court for the District of Rhode Island. It's been a long time since we've had an in-person trial and a lot has changed at the District Court. After participants are screened by court security, they will proceed directly to the court testing room. The testing room is located off the front lobby of the courthouse, down the hall past the jury assembly room, where they will be administered a COVID test. The court, in partnership with the Rhode Island Department of Health, is administering the Binax Now rapid COVID test. This test takes 15 minutes from testing to results and results will be reported to the Department of Health. Hello, my name is Michael Simoncelli and I'm the Operations Manager here at the United States District Court for the District of Rhode Island. Due to the layout of the courthouse, the number of people required for a criminal jury impanelment and the maximum number of people that we can safely put in any space in the courthouse for a jury impanelment, the impanelment will be held in multiple spaces throughout the courthouse and will be unlike other jury impanelments that you have been a part of before. The main impanelment space will be courtroom one, as this room will permit us to place 28 jurors socially distanced in one place. The room will hold the jurors who are in the box. The box will comprise the number of people on the jury, plus 16 peremptory strikes permitted under the rules. The remaining reserve of jurors will be held in other locations throughout the courthouse where they will watch the proceedings in courtroom one by video. Attorneys for the defendant and the government will receive the complete list of jurors appearing along with their questionnaires and other jury-related documentation before the day of impanelment. Attorneys will be provided a list of the pre-selected jurors in the box in courtroom one along with an alphabetical list of the reserve jurors on the day of impanelment. Each judge will decide whether the voir dire will be done by the judge, attorney, or both. As with the impanelment, the trial will be conducted differently than those trials in our pre-pandemic world. All attorneys participating in the trial will have a final pre-trial conference in the courthouse, where they will be able to view the trial space and will be able to discuss trial logistics with the court. The trial will be held in the court's jury assembly room. The jury assembly room will be used instead of one of the rooms in the courthouse because the jury assembly room is the safest location to hold a gathering of a significant number of people for a sustained period of time. The dedicated air handling system in the jury assembly room turns the air over more than 10 times per hour, far above recommendations of the CDC. The jury assembly room is the only space that can accommodate the number of people needed for a criminal jury trial. And the jury assembly room is a, is a blank slate where the court can configure the room in such a way to allow a fair trial to occur in the safest manner possible for all participants. Now, while the air handling system allows for the court to conduct the trial safely in the jury assembly room, it is important that the room be permitted to rest for a period of time after being occupied for 60 to 90 minutes continuously. Attorneys should anticipate a far more truncated trial schedule than normal. The court will provide each attorney with a space to go to during break and rest periods. During deliberations, jurors will view all admitted exhibits on a large video screen in the jury deliberation space. Witnesses must be given an arrival time by attorneys, and this must be communicated to court staff in advance of their entry. As with anyone else entering the courthouse during the trial, witnesses will need to go through all layers of entrance screening. In addition, attorneys must identify any special requirements for witnesses, for example, the need for an interpreter, 
in advance of trial and communicate those requirements to the court. Unlike in the courtrooms, the technology in the jury assembly room is limited. There is no ELMO available and attorneys will only be able to show exhibits to the court, jury, and witnesses by a laptop connection located at counsel table. Attorneys must bring the laptop they intend to use at trial to the final pretrial conference to ensure compatibility with court systems. When displaying exhibits during trial, counsel must be aware of the limitations inherent in the evidence display equipment in the jury assembly room. Unlike the courtrooms, the courtroom deputy does not have the ability to limit who sees a particular piece of evidence when it is displayed by counsel. Parties, of course, are encouraged to stipulate to as many exhibits as possible, and any disputed exhibits will need to be dealt with outside of the jury's hearing. In addition, parties should be prepared to bring hard copies of identification-only exhibits, as there is no way to show those exhibits to the court and witness only without the jury seeing it. As with the impanelment, if sidebars need to occur, the judge and counsel will move to the dedicated sidebar space. A limited number of non-case participants will be able to view the proceedings at the courthouse in one of the dedicated video rooms. Due to the number of people required for in the jury assembly room, non-case participants will not be allowed to view the proceedings from this room. Dr. Bromage, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Nora. Um, just letting people know, I did have the uh, second shot of Moderna yesterday, so my brain is a little foggy right now, so I forgive some of my answers if they're not as clear as they should be. Um, so just to introduce myself, I'm Aaron Bromage. I'm a professor of biology at the University of Massachusetts. Um, I have been working with the courts um, right throughout the US, uh, particularly the Northeast and California, uh, since I think it was about August of last year, um, trying to help them navigate their way through uh, the pandemic and what you can actually safely achieve uh, inside court spaces. Uh, that's included everything from inside the courtroom to clerk spaces to uh, places where the, the court interacts with the public in general. Um, in addition to this, I've done the schools of Rhode Island. Um, I've done a lot of uh, large um, businesses, Bank of America, Assurance, um, but also uh, been working with the film and television industry, um, helping them get back up and get open um, over the last uh, eight months, nine months or so. Uh, we've actually spent uh, quite a lot of time um, in the courtroom in you know, design and layout. I think that's maybe the, the eighth design that we've had for that particular room. Um, you know, finding one that actually works so that we have good eye contact between, um, you know, the witness, the judge, the attorneys, as well as the, um, the jury. Um, we have recruited the GSA. Um, so they've come in and they have ordered the space. They have fixed up the HVAC system where it was deficient um, and have actually done a really good job with all of the courts in New England. Uh, making sure that we're actually doing the right thing in regards to uh, air quality inside the spaces where we'll assemble. Um, now, focusing a little bit on infection, I just want to really highlight to the group that, you know, over the 12 months now that we've been running through this pandemic, um, there's been a lot of, not misinformation, but evolving information that's actually happened um, to where we actually have a fairly good idea. We have a very good idea about how transmission actually occurs. At the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of uh, effort was put on um, you know, droplets and uh, contact surfaces. Hence the, the plexiglass that ended up everywhere in schools and in courtrooms. But we now know uh, 12 months into this that it's really not large droplets that drive the pandemic. It's actually shared air. So that's the air that I breathe out and you inhale in. Um, so infection actually occurs over time, every time you breathe in, um, if you don't have spaces with good filtration or good outside ventilation or UV light, uh, what you end up with is, um, you know, every breath that you take is one or 2% somebody else's air. And then over the period of hours, that could actually lead to infection. So what we've actually done in the court is we've put in a layered approach. Obviously, we're trying to get people to stay home if they have any symptoms at all, headaches, uh, fever, uh, loss of you know, smell and taste. So that's the first layer of eliminating the pathogen from there. 
Um, we then have, you know, being very fortunate to get access to the antigen tests through Rhode Island Department of Public Health. So now we can really look for somebody that is actually infectious in the court spaces. Um, if somebody manages to get past that space inside the courtroom, we have the layout that keeps everybody physically distant away from each other. So we've got more than six feet between people. Um, we're focused on air quality. So again, if you had an infected person in that space, um, we're aiming for four air changes per hour. Six is regarded as ideal. Um, in that particular space, we got 10, um, including um, air changes, ventilation, and UV. So literally every pass, the air goes through the air handling system. It is reducing the risk in that space by around about 98% with each pass. So it's really quite an efficient system that has been put in place, and that's why we ended up in that space. We also realized that um, during a court proceeding, we have a lot of people talking and talking is one of the most effective ways to transmit. Um, and so again, we needed to make sure that we put the people who were talking into a space where we can filter their air out very quickly. And that's why we rearranged um, the grand jury place, um, grand jury, jury room so that we could accommodate um, people that would be talking, um, everything from witnesses to attorneys um, in that space and feel comfortable that if somebody got through our layers of defense, um, they don't put other people at risk uh, in that space. Uh, we've worked very hard on walking people in and out of the space. So it's not just a matter of uh, making sure that while you're sitting, uh, we you know, have everyone protected. It is you know, during lunch, it's during uh, you know, rest, restroom breaks, um, making sure that people arrive in a staggered fashion so that we don't have lots of people lining up that puts other people at risk. So we've literally put many different layers of defense together to ensure that if somebody actually gets through into our space who is infected, the impact is very low on everybody else in that place. The ideal design is obviously not having somebody in there who's infected, but if we do, I want to make sure that it is very, very difficult for them to transmit. And that's why we have taken care of the air, the distance, um, and those other aspects that we put in place. Um, I am very happy now just to stop and move on to the next part and then be available for questions, um, Nora, whenever you're ready. Thanks, Aaron. Does does anyone have any questions? Uh, we can take a small break for questions here now. If if something came up, um, you can either put your question in the chat or you can just unmute yourself and ask. Uh, Nora, I thought it might be useful to if Dr. Bromage could speak to that um, testing approach that we were uh, discussing in the walkthrough. So I think that George, what you're talking about, if I remember correctly, was we were talking about kind of the curve of infection and how the antigen test catches people at when they're infectious, which is what we care about. Um, and but that you you um, that is that right? Is that correct? That's correct. I just wanted everybody to be aware of that and why it's reliable. Yes. Yeah. So um, the test, the Binex and out, like the Binexa test, is actually a very very good test um, to detect if somebody is infectious. Um, so there's two states that you can actually be in, well, two major states that you can be in when you're infected. It can be infected and not able to transmit and infected and infectious. Um, infectious means that you have a lot of virus in your mouth, in your nose, in your upper airway, that every time you talk, cough, sneeze, breathe for that matter, um, it can be expelled out into the environment. So PCR is obviously the best test that we have. It's the gold standard. Um, unfortunately, you know, you're looking at at least 24 hours for a turnaround on a test in Rhode Island. So if we actually went for PCR, it is possible someone can go from um, negative to infectious within the period between the swab you taking, you're taking and the time that they come in your courthouse. So 24 to 36 hours later. Basically, the infection curve, we start off really low on day zero, you get exposed, it builds up very quickly. And then once it builds up, it comes down and then it's a big long tail. Um, you've probably heard with PCR a thing called a CT score. And a CT score is how many times you need to run the PCR. So we um, take the sample, we run it once, and it takes one copy and turns it into two. 
We then run it again and takes those two and turns it to four and four to eight and eight to 16. So every time we have to run a cycle, um, that is a, an indication of how much virus starting material is actually there. Now, if you're trying to catch somebody that's in that CT range of 30 to 37, which would be regarded as a positive by the PCR, it is very unlikely that you are in the stage of being able to transmit. Um, most of the people that I see that are involved in transmission events have a PCR score of about 18 to 22. So they're about a million to 10 million times higher in viral load in their mouth. So um, what we're doing with the antigen test is we're taking the antigen test, which we know is not as sensitive, but the big point about it is, is we actually turn it around very quickly. So we get the results within 15 minutes. So what we can actually do, for example, with a multi-day trial, we can um, do the antigen test on the first day and we can do the antigen test on the second day and we can do it on the third day, um, you know, just depending on the court resources and catch people as they're starting to come up. So when we actually look at using this type of test, specifically the Binexa, um, we see um, it's about 99% agreement with PCR when the CT score is under 30. So it is really very good at catching a person who could be in our space that could transmit to others. Uh, there was a question in the chat, doctor, that um, we, we were saying that uh, fully vaccinated people do not have to be tested. Um, and then Judge McElroy wanted to know if that means that vaccinated people cannot be infectious. So um, I, I guess I'm going to defer to, um, you know, Judge, where did we end up landing, Judge Smith? Is it voluntary or it's enforced? I think where we're going to come down is that uh, the testing will be uh, mandatory with, with respect to attorneys and uh, witnesses. Uh, with jurors, we're going to encourage them, but not make it uh, mandatory. And, and and judges, you know, mandatory. Everyone who's in the court process. Yeah. So basically, when we were talking about like the layered strategy approach, a person who is talking is actually putting out about 75 times more respiratory droplets than a person who's sitting there quietly. So if you've got a, you know, a jury person that's sitting there who is infected and they're not talking, um, uh, what is coming out is just coming out with tidal breathing and breathing at a very low level. You know, as an example, it through breathing, they might be putting out one virus every breath. Um, but when they're talking, they're putting out 75 viruses every breath. And if they're shouting, it could be closer to three to 400 and singing even more. The, um, the uh, loudness of what they actually do is directly associated with how much respiratory droplets they actually put out. So when we were putting this together, we made sure that it was not optional for people that were talking in the courtroom. Um, and then if a jury person decides that they want to opt out of it, we're not adding that much extra risk into the work, into the space because they're meant to be silent. I would potentially think about it when we get into jury deliberations that it might be important to actually have it because we're putting a lot of people into to that space, but we need to, to iron that out um, appropriately. Um, now, in regards to vaccination, once you've actually met um, the fully vaccinated status, um, so two weeks past your second dose, um, or I think it's four weeks after the J&J &J dose, um, as long as you can verify that you've been vaccinated, um, I don't really think that you need to test. Um, and, you know, we're moving towards that. I know in some states um, we have been able to get people that work in courts vaccinated. Um, we'll get there eventually with Rhode Island. It's just going to take a little bit longer here. So I think that anybody that has um, documented, tested positive and recovered um, and anybody in the last 90 days and anybody that has been vaccinated and is past that two week date um, could really skip over the testing. Now, could they be infected still? So the best science says yes, but it's rare. So as an example with the Pfizer, um, we've seen a very clear difference between um, vaccinated versus unvaccinated in regards to mild to moderate disease. Uh, very, very clear. Um, so we've seen a, a very clear difference between, um, you know, between that. The first data that's actually come out in regards to transmission suggests that 
um, it's dropping transmission somewhere between 88 and 92%. Now that doesn't mean a person who is vaccinated, um, exposed to the virus is still you know, harboring virus, but it's at 10 times lower. Um, it means more along the lines of one in every 10 people that are vaccinated and exposed, one of those could potentially transmit. But there was really good data that came out today that said even in the situation that that's happening, their viral load is much, much lower than a person who does not have um, pre-existing immunity. So it's an open question at this moment, um, but we've got to go with the science that we have. And the science that we have said says that it would be very difficult for a person who is fully vaccinated um, to transmit to another person. Uh, and a big part of that is because there's very few of them that actually become symptomatic after infection. Thank you. Sorry about that. I was actually, I unmuted to yell at my kids to close the door <laughs> uh, because I am used to muting to do that. And I realized I was on mute. So I apologize for that. Uh, there was another question, doctor, about the, uh, the amount of time in that room. Um, the question was the trial, you know, trials sometimes last up to six hours a day. And is there a safe amount of time um, to be in that room? How would you answer that? Yeah. So I actually think given the quality of the air that we have in that space, um, you, could, you could run the trial nonstop without breaks. The problem that you actually have though is if you run a trial without breaks, you're going to have um, various interruptions as people need to leave the space, um, you know, to go to the bathroom or you know, take breaks and things like that. So um, adding a rest time in there adds to the extra layers of defense that you have. So think about what happens, even though we've got great air, um, rather than if I'm infected and breathing out, it keeps building up and building up till it gets to the point where it's being stripped out of the air at the same rate that I'm putting it in. So in a room where we don't have ventilation filtration, it builds up and builds up and builds up. And then eventually it comes to equilibrium at a really high level. Um, in that space, it starts down low and it just goes like this. Um, and then eventually we'll flatten out based on the exchange rate of air inside that place. So um, I think that it adds an extra layer. Um, it's not critical that it's at an hour and a half. It could be at two, it could be at one, it could follow the appropriate um, canter of the proceeding if there was a good time to break. But it's one of those things that just adds an extra layer of defense for the people in that space, as long as you are adequately controlling the mixing that actually happens as they leave the space. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question for Dr. Bramage? Jose, I see your question. We'll have to ask the marshal service what their procedures are over there, but I know they're being um, very cautious as well. So what I do with my vaccine card, I actually just have a photo on my phone um, and that's what everybody should do. So you don't actually have to carry it with you, put it somewhere safe, um, but snap a photo of it. And that serves as you know proof. So yesterday I forgot my vaccination card when I went to Gillette to get vaccinated, but I was able to show them um, the photo on my phone and they just wrote out a different card with um, both vaccinations on it. Uh, I see a question from Lee uh, Vilker that suggests that the attorneys might be more comfortable if um, jurors were tested. And, um, uh, you know, we do get that, Lee. We've had a lot of conversation about it. The problem is this. We don't have, have to go into it in too much depth. But uh, some jurors may be concerned about the reporting of, of the test to the Department of Health and the, and the possibility of a false positive and what that might mean for them in terms of quarantine. Now, um, Dr. Bromage has, has a, an answer to that, which is a protocol that we would follow for that person, but we don't have total clarity yet, as far as I know, that the Department of Health would accept that protocol and it would involve additional testing, uh, both the Binex test and then a PCR test. And if it turned out that it was a, indeed a false positive, you know, his view would be that there would be no purpose in that person quarantining. But, um, but until we have that kind of clarity, we're just a little concerned about putting jurors in a position where we tell them it's absolutely mandatory and whether that uh, skews, the, um, skews the, the jury in some some way. So, you know, it puts us in a position where if we do that, we say it's mandatory and a jury, juror says I'm not doing it, then we have to excuse the jury, juror. And what does that do to the 
uh, to the uh, integrity of the of, of the jury. Now, if everybody stipulated to that on all sides, then maybe we could we could come to a to an ag agreement on that. But I don't want to see a situation where somebody attacks the the verdict because the uh, a juror was excused for not taking the uh, the rapid test. Does that does that make sense? I think um, Vilka is talking. Um, I, I totally understand the concern. Um, I, I personally, I don't want to speak for everybody. I feel personally better knowing that the jurors were being tested as well. I mean, I understand that the concern about, um, you know, the, the effect it could have on the jury pool, but I, I'm not saying I have the answer to it, but it definitely would make me and probably some other people on the call feel better. Well, we can take it up at the at the pretrial conference. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I don't know how the other judges feel, but if if both sides stipulated to to that being a requirement for the for the impanelment, and that there was no objection to an excusal based solely on refusal to take take the the test, everybody put that on the record. I'd be comfortable with that. I'm sure our clients would be very. Uh agreeable and, and responsible in making that decision, Judge. <laughs> Authorizing stipulations of all kind, no doubt. Uh, little concerns are always reasonable, George. There's a question, uh, Becky, you asked a question about masks in the courtroom uh, while witnesses are testifying. Yes, so masks are required in the courtroom. We have a clear mask that witnesses have been using to testify before the grand jury. Um, Judge, do you want to answer more about that? Yeah, we have, and this might be a good segue to uh, having the attorneys talk a little bit about their experience in tri in the trials in October. Um, but we we use that protocol. The jurors used a clear mask. I'm sorry, not jurors. Witnesses used a clear mask. Uh, attorneys had a regular mask. Uh, everybody was required to be masked throughout the trial, um, and. And we have added since the trials in October, we now have a, a small HEPA filter unit that sits right on the table where the um, where the witness will be speaking to add a, a little bit extra layer of, of filtration to the to the air. Um, so maybe uh, maybe we could hear from from the attorneys a little bit about their about their experience. Uh, Mark and Katie, maybe you should go first since you were in all the trials, I think. I actually saw Mark's screen free, so I'm happy to start. So I don't, I don't know if he dropped off, but um, in, in terms of I, I, going with the, um, the clear masks, I actually thought that they were, um, I, was, I was concerned at the beginning uh, when we said we're going to go for, um, for trial. I was concerned that the clear masks weren't going to be um, easy enough to see through to, you know, judge credibility, see facial expressions, and I actually thought they were really um, perfectly fine. Uh, the only challenge that I think we saw with our clients and other witnesses with the masks is that if you have a witness up on the stand um, for a significant period of time. Um, just by virtue of condensation in their plastic, um, they start to break down and there's a sense of panic. And um, at least one of our clients, I think, panicked midway through trying to fiddle with it and, and lost track of questions. So I think that was just something that we were able to um, address pretty quickly and um, let him know, you know, you don't need to panic. And we swapped out masks um, a couple of times but I thought the, you know, I thought the clear masks were, were a great way around it. I think, I mean, I would have preferred if they weren't able or if they didn't have masks because they were behind the plexiglass. But when you're obviously balancing safety considerations um, and a slight distraction of the mask, uh, safety from our perspective, I think um, won out. In, in terms of other uh, considerations and and I think challenges. I think I, I've got to be honest. I think the whole process moved about as smoothly as it it could have. Um, I mean, you obviously have your uh, regular hiccups that come with being on trial, but I think with 
the one real challenge that we faced was with exhibits when you couldn't come to an agreement with the other side and, and stipulate. It happened relatively infrequently, but it did happen and that became a challenge and just having, uh, knowing that you had to have hard copies with you um, for those exhibits uh, when you couldn't come to that agreement made it a little bit easier for the, I think we figured that out by the second trial. Um, and then being really up to speed with shortcuts on the computer for technology, um, having good copies, because it's hard to see on the TVs. I mean, you only have um, limited TVs. I think there were um, two or three big ones for us to, to watch and for the jurors to be able to see. So making sure that, um, you know, test it out before trial starts uh, and you can actually see what the jurors are seeing with your exhibits would be a recommendation I have. Yeah, I'll just make one comment on that because we didn't mention it before, but we do have a new, a new layout for uh, TV screens, which we're which we're working on, which will actually put them on the floors, uh, between the chairs, so that jurors can look down and, and see the exhibits. Um, that work. I don't, I don't know, Judge, if uh, if there's in this round of trials, if there's the ability for virtual witnesses. If there is, I'll touch on that. But if if not, I won't. Yeah, we might we might get to that uh, get to that in a second. Um, I see Joe and Frank Castellavari there. Do, do either of you want to make a comment about your experiences? I would uh, make two general comments. Uh, first and foremost is the uh, the staff in the courthouse was exceptional, very accommodating, very helpful, uh, and uh, our trial was before Judge Smith who was open to suggestions as we went along. I think, in fact, uh, Mark may correct me on this. We, ours was the first trial. And I think, Judge, you had indicated that uh, the witnesses would initially use the same mask as everyone else. But Mark and I had suggested that can they use a clear mask and the court was willing to accommodate us. And the, uh, the witnesses at least had the uh, clear mask because that's important, I think, for gauging credibility, looking at expressions. Uh, for that same reason, when you select a jury, I like to look at someone in the face to see if I like them, if they like me, you lose all of that. Uh, but that's something you have to, to live with. Uh, following up on what Katie said, because it's published to everyone, it just can't be published to the attorneys in the court, you have to think ahead as to what exhibits or documents you may need that may not, not be marked. In our trial, we had uh, depositions, which were not marked as exhibits, obviously, but I had to utilize those in confronting witnesses. And so I had to think ahead and make sure I had those portions of the depositions and make copies for the other side, for the witness, for the judge, for the clerk, for the stenographer. So something you wanna think about. Uh, if you have witnesses by Zoom, we had a witness by Zoom. Uh, it would be nice if they followed your instructions like to get into a area where there's a strong internet and wear a tie and jacket. My witness, of course, decided that he was going to go, I think it was a happy hour at Crackle Barrel, <laughs> Crackle Barrel uh, down in Florida. So we were interrupted by waitresses, clinging glasses and didn't look very good in front of the jury. Um, and the public access actually uh, was quite uh, good. Uh, there's a separate room across from where we tried the case where court personnel are able to stream it. And uh, actually it was nice because my uh, uh, grandchildren out of state in North Carolina and New Jersey were able to see me actually try a case, even though Mark kicked my butt in the trial, so. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, Judge, this is Mark. Can I make one comment? Sure. Uh, I got cut off for, for a minute, so I don't know what was said, but one uh, practical suggestion for uh, that the court accommodated us on um, is that, you know, the jurors are spaced out. And so juror number eight for civil cases, and I assume in criminal cases, you've got 16, but juror number eight or 16 is 
is fairly not close to the witness. And I don't, it might have been uh, Mike Simicelli, maybe you came up with this, but th they don't have to stay in those seats. And so I can't remember, Joe, if we did it in our trial or if Katie, we did it in the other two, but a question was asked of the jurors, who has the better eyesight? And it's usually younger people, they should go in the back. And the, and the jurors that don't have as good eyesight or don't have uh, you know, hearing as good as the others, they should be up front. And um, it actually uh, makes the jurors more collegial too. It's like, yeah, you go up front or you go, go in back. And I think that was a, uh, a good thing to do. I just wanted to mention it. Yeah, that was mentioned at the end of our trial, Mark. That was one of the comments that yeah. they made. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's right. So um, I think that's uh, uh, something to, to think about. The other thing with litigators who tend to uh, kind of roam the courtroom, uh, you can't do it. you got to be stationary at that podium. In fact, that was another thing I think that uh, the judge accepted our recommendation initially. I think, Judge Smith, you indicated we would have to do our questioning seated at the table. And both Mark and I said, can we at least have a podium? And we were given, I think we were each given our own podium. But yeah. there again, you had to stay at the podium. You had to make sure you talk loud and clear. And as loud and clear as you speak, everybody knows who has been conversing with anyone with masks, it still comes out somewhat muffled. So that's a concern that you have to have when you're trying the case. Yeah. Because can the air we, handling okay. system is quite is you know quite loud in that room. Can is it is it okay to get into um, theories of, of uh, trials with uh, this, or do you not want us to? <laughs> well, I, I imagine the lawyers might like to might like to hear some of that hear some of that. But let me ask Frank Castellavari if he had any comments. Um, some of the things I thought about after this. Some of the things John Mark talked about. Um, the fact that you had to stay in one particular place, um, I actually love that. That's been one of the criticisms of my trial ability that I move around too much. I felt during that week completely safe. I never thought twice about this virus. Um, unlike, I guess, most of the attorneys, I do a lot of my work in state court. I feel and felt when I compare what happened, how really what a professional job uh, the federal court did. Um, I'm, in, <laughs> I'm in other places now that I look around and, you know, I, I just look around. Um, I love that. The difference, I think, to some of the trial lawyers, it was, whereas when you do a regular jury trial in a courtroom, the jurors are more together. It was almost like being on stage you were an actor in your little spot and you couldn't move, which I liked. And the jurors were all on separate islands. And when you spoke to them, um, you had, you, it, it's, you had to like talk to each one individually where they weren't together as a group. They were all individually, those eight people. And you had to reach all of them. I enjoyed that. Um, Everything, I mean, I loved when Judge Smith did the nine to two. When I left at 210, 220, and I had to hear my client on the way back to the Holiday Inn, I mean, I was tired, but we got it done. I didn't, I didn't miss the hour lunch break. I liked that part of it. It was very, very different. I mean, I, I felt absolutely ab safer than I've been in any other courtroom, and I, I've been... I've been in the traffic tribunal quite a bit. Um, I, I, you know, done some divorces in my office. So it was very interesting. It was very different. In my case, it actually helped. I had to stay in one spot. Um, I couldn't near, go near the witness. As Judge Smith knows, I had a problem with the exhibits. I thought about it overnight when I figured out what was gonna go on. If I had to do it again, I would have a tech guy in there and just pay for him as my assistant, which is what I do when I put a divorce through in my office. Um, I liked it. I enjoyed it. It was different. It was a different jury trial because the jurors were separated. You could not go near the witness. It was more, as you all know, we are actors, you know, 
putting on a play or doing a drama, it, it, the way it's set up in that jury assembly room, I, I loved it. It was a bigger studio. It was a bigger field. And you had to get everybody individually. Um, and, and, you know, the whole, all, all the clerks, um, the judges. I mean, I haven't felt safer since then, to be perfectly honest with you. So, I mean, I would do it again. Um, I liked the, the nine to two. I liked it because you got in it, especially with this damn virus going on. You're in, you, you had to get everybody ready and everybody got there. It was um, once my witness, I had to get his ex-girlfriend in there and I had to get her there. And she, it was a little delay. And I'm saying, I got to get this person in and out. I like that part of it better. As I go on in my career, I, I just think about how different it was. And there were some big time advantages. And those advantages of in and out, um, the protocol, which I guess more than Joe and Mark, I had a little more problems with the with the Zoom and you know answering the questions. But once I got it, I liked it and I felt safe. I must say, and I gotta tell you, I haven't felt safer than I did in, during that week. And believe me, I've told everybody. So I would do it again if I had to go back in. I would do it without a doubt, without a doubt. Thank, I would go thanks, there. Frank. Thank, Thank you, you, Frank. Uh, Mark, did you want to add one more comment before we open up the questions? Uh, yeah, just, uh, and I don't want to get too far in, into the strategy, but when, you know, you're trying a case to jurors now who are six feet apart and they've got masks on and they're looking at screens for uh, the evidence that, that, you know, the documentary no. evidence. You can't, in my opinion, at least on the civil side, you can't inundate them with, with lots of documents with lots of words you, you've got to you've got to be quick precise have a document you have to have long, broad themes because when you think about it they don't have the hard copies and they're yeah. as frank correctly points out they're on an island and so i think it it it's it pairs down your questioning and it should pare down your exhibits and frankly, your themes at, at trial uh, so that when they go in the deliberation room, they, they're pinpointed in exactly what they should do. That, that's my only comment on that. I think it, it, that's the only th difference I saw in a trial. And just like everyone else says, the court did such a great job of of doing this, that it, yeah. it was the same thrill that you get at every trial. I mean, it was just, it was, just, it was the same, except for a mass and some little bits of differences. Not really a, a, a big deal. You're gonna get in there, it's gonna be the same and you're gonna like it. That, that's all I have, thank you, Your Honor. Great, thanks, thanks, Mark. Yeah. So maybe we just open it up to everybody uh, for additional questions of anybody of the attorneys or if you wanna go back to Dr. Bromage or, uh, or uh, anyone else. I know I saw a question from Pam Chin here that about the trial day. And I think as Frank mentioned, I think at least for me, my intention would be to do the trial day from about nine to 1.30 or two and uh, not to have any lunch break because as Dr. Bromage has pointed out to us, the lunch break creates a whole new vector of risk because the, the jurors go out, they go to a deli or a restaurant or they come back or whatever. So we just kept it to 20 minute breaks. We, we did provide, uh, enhanced uh, snacks for the jurors and they were all individually wrapped. We have tables set out out in the, uh, the front foyer of the courthouse so that jurors can go and find a place to sit where they're completely distanced from each other and they can eat something and have a coffee or whatever, but then they're back in, we finish the day and then they're, they're out. So that, I, think, I think that would be the expectation, probably a nine to two schedule or, or 1.30. Or, other questions? Judge. Kevin. Thanks. Um, I was wondering if the, the jurors from the uh, civil trials gave you any feedback about um, how, they, uh, how they felt about other folks there in masks and what they took from that, seeing everybody in a mask. Obviously, in a criminal trial, you've got your, your client in a mask, and uh, you know he's already the focus of the, of the trial, and now you've got a guy in a mask as a focus. So, uh, you know, I'm concerned with the, the jurors uh, really 
uh, taking a negative view because they can't actually see the uh, defendant. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, I I can't remember. Did we, Mark? Did we have you guys talk to the jury? I think we did, didn't we? We we did, Judge. Uh, at the end of our case, anyway, we did. Yeah. Yeah, we did. If I recall, they didn't really have too many problems. They said they could hear us and understood us. I think Mark's point was well taken that they thought that the younger people with the better hearing and the better eyesight could go to the back of the room where the older people uh, should go to the front. But other than that, I think they, yeah. were, they were fine. Kevin, you got to remember, they're wearing masks too. Like it, mm -hmm. we, it actually creates more of a, uh, we're all in this together, I thought. You know, so uh, it, it, we same thing with us. I mean, our clients had masks on and, and so forth. But I, I really thought that uh, after the first hour, and maybe Katie, you can weigh in, that they were really everyone was okay with it. And um, I don't, I, I didn't, I don't, I didn't, I don't see that as an issue. But uh, uh, that's on the civil side. No, I didn't think I didn't think people the, the fact everyone was wearing masks and I think um, this is actually a strategy maybe that got pulled from Mark and um, Joe's trial is that we all uh, wore the same masks um, as the jurors so our clients were wearing the same masks our witnesses were all wearing the same masks um, so the I think it was like the surgical mask that the, the court provided and so it wasn't, you know, you have the KN95 or you have the N95 mask and you've got a superior mask. So, so it, I, I thought it at least put us all on, um, you know, level playing field with, with masks. We're all, we're all wearing the same thing. Okay. So the, were the, were the jurors um, comfortable, I guess there, because I'm also concerned that they have to go through all the rigmarole and the testing and the masks and everything else. And that being a negative impact because if they're not comfortable they're not going to be happy and if they're not happy that might be against <laughs> again my client no one expressed any discovery we didn't have testing when we tried our cases in october uh yeah. and we tested initially when we first walked in to make sure we didn't have any symptoms and our temperature was fine but we didn't do any of the rapid testing uh, as you will evidently have this time around but mm -hmm. no one really expressed and, and, and judge smith was very uh, punctual in terms of making sure every hour and 15 minutes to no more than an hour and a half, we took that break. So it gave everybody a break if they wanted to lower their masks somewhere. And uh, although I don't know if they could do it actually in the uh, in the foyer, probably not. No, they could go outside though. And right, they, yeah. But honestly, Kevin, uh, you know, we do we do so much screening of these jurors that by the time they get to the uh, to, it was the fastest jury selection in history, I think, um, because none of them wanted to be excused and they were just not uh, unhappy. They were actually very happy to be there. I, I think I think we all had the feeling like these people were really glad to get out of the house and have something to okay. do. And, <laughs> how, about, how about sitting and, in the open, Judge? They how were doing it, you know, and they, they got to get out of the house, but they also felt like, God, I'm in a safe place where people thought of all these things so i'm okay with it judge how about them sitting in the open like that with no desk or like carol or anything around them i mean i i wondered after i saw that if if i wouldn't feel uncomfortable and you know be more interested in getting out of there than than sitting on display in the middle of a room you know like that i don't know i didn't sense any that they had any any problem with it it wasn't exactly the configuration you saw in the video. It was slightly different than that, but it was pretty close to that. And um, I don't know, did any of you? I, I, I think, Your Honor, the frequent breaks, uh, and George, I'll, ad I'll address it to you. I think that, that you know, they weren't just on display, so to speak, because we were in for an hour and 15 minutes. Everyone's focused on the witness. Out they go, in they come back. So I don't, uh, in any of the trials we did, uh, I didn't. I didn't see any uncomfortable jurors, you know, fiddling around in their seats and all that. And I, I, I see your point because you, you like the barrier, you know. But I didn't see it at all. I, I think I think they were fine with it. I thought they were fine, and and they were. I, I thought the jurors for the two trials that um, I had, they were 
really engaged with us. Um, I don't know if it was, it, at, at times it felt like they were more engaged than, you know, previous trials I've had and they were active participants. I, I think, I honestly think that they were some of the, the best stars that we've had um, engagement wise. I saw that Bob Mann had a question that's interesting as to whether yeah. or not you should have an IT person. Uh, Mark was kind enough to allow me to borrow Ryan from his office to serve as my IT person, it, it, it helped. Uh, otherwise, I think you probably would need someone. Uh, otherwise it gets very, I think it would become very cumbersome because your laptop is at your desk, you're standing at the podium. If you wanted to display a, an exhibit, you'd have to go back there. It's, it's not as easy as when you had the cot, when you're operating from the cot. That's my now, own I, observation. I, I, I will say this, Joe, when the, the cases Katie and I tried, of course, she helped me, um, but then I'm useless. So she did do it on, you did it on your own. And it, yeah, it was I, not, not bad, but I, I agree. You should have someone else doing it. There uh, should right? be at one, at least one technologically literate person. Um, I, I probably per side, but if you get along with the other side, then I think one will probably um, suffice. I mean, I, I would, I would want to do it on my own, but when I was doing the technology, I got, um, I think we worked really closely with um, the court's IT. They gave um, some good shortcuts and short keys to be able to uh, blow things up and make them smaller. And um, it, it wasn't bad. And, and honestly, if, if you're organized about it and you know exactly where you're going with the document which i think you need to do for this kind of a trial um just because you want to get in get out as um efficiently as possible it's it's doable um it would have been nice for for uh us to have or for me to have somebody who was moving the documents but it was it was doable i think it just made me think a lot harder about what what I was putting on the screen in front of the jury. It's because you're not you, IT you, challenged like Mark and I. Yeah, that's right. But the, <laughs> the, the other thing is the um, the other thing is to to work with Carrie. You were outstanding, Carrie Potter, and 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 all of the clerks, outstanding. Uh, it, it, and you've got to you've got to utilize them, the, all the clerks, ahead of time because we would come to you with an issue, and you'd they'd get right on it before the jurors were there. And I, instead of, you know, in the middle of a question saying, oh, we got a problem here. So uh, the point the, is, this the, is new to all great. of us. So and we all try to help each other, the court staff, the judges, the attorneys. So keep that in mind. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I see another question here from Chuck. Uh, and I don't, is is Aaron, Aaron, are you still uh, with us? Because I think this would really be a good question for you, whether there was consideration given for jurors to wear clear masks. And um, we didn't really think about that, but it, um, but I'd like to hear Aaron's thought if he has one on, on clear masks versus either the surgical or the N95s or KN95s. Yeah, the problem with um, the clear masks is the, the amount of condensation that builds up inside um, those masks. They get wet and they get nasty. Um, not so much people that are just breathing, um, definitely with people that are talking, you'll actually see them start dripping water down them and it can get quite yuck. Um, the, you know, the important thing that we need to do is make sure that we standardize the level of the mask that's in there um, and we set a uh, very specific level. So there may now be masks that are out um, that actually are well ventilated so that moisture doesn't build up. And so we have to have a look. I mean, if anyone finds a, a clear mask that gives good uh, respiratory protection um, that doesn't fog up, so it has to have a, a way to get good air exchange, um, then I'd be really happy to see it. But we had a lot of trouble trying to get schools back, um, speech therapists and things like that, because every clear mask that we used would just fog up. So we had to improve the air quality environment, put a physical barrier between the speech therapist and the students so that we stopped the direct large jet um, going onto their face. And we usually sat them right near a window with a fan sucking the air out to make it, um, you know, make it safe. So, you know, there has been some great advancements in masks. I just haven't seen any that have got around the, um, the humidity problem, the condensation problem that they might have 
um, and that may become distracting in a courtroom. Great, thanks. Well, um, we're a little over uh, an hour, but I want to make sure we've covered any anything that um, uh, any anything that people feel that we need to cover. Um, so, are there? Any I will other point out we've done court proceedings in New Hampshire, um, and they've worked really well. Um, and when they work really well, it comes down to the judge to engage everybody in the room and, you know, ask them about, is anyone concerned? Is everyone happy with, you know, what's going on? Just really, you know, care for the people that are in there. Um, and we actually have done post-trial surveys of the people that have been there, obviously not the defendant, but, you know, the jurors. And they've actually been quite remarkable in their positivity, you know, when they actually come back. It, um, it's, you know, what was heard here, I think, from Judge Francis that, uh, it, oh, no, sorry, um, attorney, that it's actually um, a very safe experience. Yeah. I think we did surveys, didn't we, uh, Frank? And, and we did. Friend? Yeah. And, and, and we received similar, you know, remarks about, um, you know, speaking positively of the experience and appreciative of the, uh, you know, protocols that we had in place. Okay. Uh, See, John um, McAdams was asking about video broadcasts of the proceedings even after he moved to full-time um, in-person trials. Uh, Nora might be in a position to answer this. I think that we we will we will have Zoom broadcasting out for as long as the the order from the uh, the emergency order from the AO allows us to do that. But Nora, you you know what the timetables are on that, I think, right? Yeah, it's unclear, Judge, when that will be lifted. But rule a uh, federal rule fifty three, you know, prohibits broadcasting of trial proceedings in federal court. So we we're hoping, um, John. That's a we're we're kind of in talks as as are many people in talks with the AO and trying to encourage this as long as possible. It does seem like the longer the pandemic goes on, the harder it's going to be to put this back in the box. Um, people are really, you know, expected the media, the public victims, like you say. Um, so we'll see. Um, but we'll keep you posted if we hear anything from the judicial conference. And Nora, you might want to mention that we're a part of that, uh, that pilot. We are judge. That's it. It's a civil pilot. It involves. Um, it, it was approved before the pandemic um, began, but it's part of the judicial conference's attempt to keep court proceedings transparent. So we are going to be transmitting um, civil cases, not trials, but civil hearings by consent of the parties to our YouTube channel live stream, and then you can access them after the proceedings. So we're hoping that that's one small step in that direction um, for the future. Great. Okay. Anybody else who has a question? I know Judge McConnell had to run. He had another appointment. And uh, so he asked me just to uh, close this up. But um, I really want to thank everybody, uh, particularly Dr. Bromash, for everything he's done for us in the court and for all the courts in New England and, and California and elsewhere. Um, he's been, he has just been tr a, just an unbelievably helpful asset uh, for us, and um, and and all of the things we've been able to do and feel confident about. I think we really owe to his um, to, to his advice and guidance with respect to everything. And and then everybody in the clerk's office who's worked so hard to uh, implement all of these things. So and thanks to the civil lawyers for showing up, uh, Mark and Katie and Frank and. Um, Joe, uh, to give your perspectives. Now that we've had this great uh, session, we don't have any trials to to, uh, <laughs> to do in April. But who knows? Maybe uh, maybe May and June. Uh, more likely June. I think, uh, given the number of cases we continued to June the other day, so uh, that may be our month. So, thanks everybody. We'll say goodbye. So long. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Judge.